Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for participating in today's webinar entitled Paper to an EBR App Suite, Simple Steps to Build Instant Digital Traceability. This discussion is co-hosted by Grantech and Tulip, and we hope that you gain useful insights into how to get started with electronic batch records. Okay, so before we get started, I'd like to offer a few tips to make sure everyone gets the most out of today's webinar. First off, it's easy to get distracted, especially as a lot of folks are very busy and some are still working from home. Phone calls, texts, and chats are all hitting us at a mile a minute, so please do your best to stay focused and engaged if you can. Next, take notes. If you find something we discussed today particularly interesting, jot it down so that you remember it for later. And if you have any questions that come up throughout the webinar, enter them into the chat. We'll be collecting them for later at the Q&A after the presentation. Finally, there's a poll question to keep things interactive. Please answer as best you can, reflecting your current circumstances as they pertain to electronic batch records. All right, well, here's a brief agenda describing the topics we're going to be covering today. We'll talk about the shift to digital, both across the manufacturing space and specifically in the life sciences industry. Next, we'll cover some barriers to digitalization and opportunities that digitalization pre presents. We'll focus on enhancing time to value and the steps to implementing digital tools to build an agile operation. And of course, we've got a call to action, encouraging you to get started today if you haven't done so. And as I said earlier, after the presentation, there will be time for questions. Okay, let's get to it. But first up, some introductions. My name is Brian Hayes, and I'm the Director of Smart Manufacturing Solutions at Grantech. I've been with the company for just over 21 years, starting out as a fresh-faced engineer straight out of school. My career has grown with the company and has been primarily focused on the life sciences industry where I've implemented and managed countless automation and information projects. As the SMS director, I manage a portfolio of productized solutions that are focused on the pharma, biopharma, and med devices industries. And I actively engage in consulting activities for our customers. I am actively involved with the International Society of Pharmaceutical Engineers, especially in Canada. And I've been in the Pharma 4.0 community of practice for about five years across many subcommittees. With me today are Florian Grabo and Bill Lorenz, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Hello, everyone. My name is Florian, Florian Grabo. I'm based out of Germany, and I'm leading here at Tulip, the global life sciences team. Um, I spent my entire career in MES for Pharma, doing project management, consulting, and implementing large-scale MES projects. So good morning or good afternoon, depending where you're viewing in from. My name is Bill Lorenz. I am an independent consultant with over 30 years of experience in life sciences. Uh, the majority of those years have been in manufacturing. Uh, my roles and experience vary from automation, manufacturing execution, data mining and analysis, process design, project management, and administrative management. Thanks, guys. Okay, now for our poll question. Where are you in your EBR journey? Have you not started thinking about it at all? Have you got a roadmap to implement an EBR solution within the next couple of years? Are you actively piloting something now? Has your pilot been successful and you're in the rollout phase? Or are you already there with minimal paper on the shop floor? Okay, go ahead and vote now. Okay, we got some votes coming in. Um, looks like there are a lot of a lot of people on the uh, with EBR on the roadmap within the next two years, and a couple of people who were already there. Maybe it took a while. So uh, thanks, everybody, for all your votes. 
looking forward to continuing the webinar. All right, so I'm gonna kick things off with an introduction, talking about trends in the life sciences manufacturing industry and the uh, shift to digital. So when I think of digitalization, a quote usually comes to my mind. Uh, back in 2016 at the World Economic Forum, the, the CEO of Accenture stated that digitalization or really the lack thereof is the main reason that over half of the companies on the Fortune 500 list have disappeared since 2000. Uh, in, in his mind, digitalization means survival for manufacturing. I mean, and personally, I, I'm not as doom and gloom as that. I like to think of digitalization in terms of the value it brings to manufacturing. Um, companies get tremendous value uh, from all this data that's available at the shop floor that they can uh, they can get from from digitalization. So, I mean, and this is true for for life the life sciences industry as well, with the added challenge of integrating regulatory compliance and quality into the digitalization equation. Uh, and so, in understanding this, uh, members of the International Society of Pharmaceutical Engineers were were keen to establish a framework for adapting some of these digital strategies to the unique operating environment of pharmaceutical manufacturing. And they formed the the Pharma 4.0, uh, what was then the Special Interest Group. Um, and in 2017, they released the Pharma 4.0 operating model, uh, and it had four discrete areas: uh, resources, organization and processes culture and information systems um, and they go beyond technology right they're focused on the manufacturing organization itself the the people the processes and the culture um, and in addition at the top and bottom of the model were two uh, what they refer to as enablers one being digital maturity and the other being uh, data integrity by design and and these are key to establishing a sound digital strategy that will work for a pharmaceutical company's unique uh, compliance needs um, so the industry sees the value of digitalization and they're embracing digitalization holistically, threading advancements in technology such as cloud and, and smart sensors and, and big data, you know, and the, and the convergence of the IT and OT worlds into manufacturing. Um, and they're going digital in both production and, you know, as well as the, uh, the lab and really across the, the supply chain. And, and by doing so, they're able to derive insights and uh, make smarter decisions which leads to increases in efficiency, higher quality products, and a, a quicker time to market. So zooming in for a bit on the regulatory compliance requirement of the industry, uh, traceability and the GXP are paramount. It's no secret. Um, organizations need to prove that they're in a, a state of control, making their products the right way, the same way, every time, according to uh, qualified procedures. Uh, you know, but, you know, paper wasn't really meant for the plant floor and, and chasing paper around leads to deviations. So digitizing records leads to less human error, uh, less of a chance for paperwork to be lost, a, a digital thread to increase traceability and an increase in overall efficiency. So digitalization seems like a no brainer. And many companies, they want to begin their digitalization journey by digitizing their, their BPR, their batch production record. But they, they typically run into issues, uh, especially trying to figure out, you know, how, to, how and where to get started. Um, as well, smaller organizations, you know, they don't want a huge monolithic MES system. You know, they want to learn to, to crawl and then to walk before they, you know, before they can run. Um, and these organizations, they also need to be nimble. They, have, they may have smaller batch sizes, or they maybe have a large variety of products, if they're, uh, and if they're a CDMO, multiple customers. Um, and this could be challenging when implementing a monolithic system. And speaking about monolithic systems, you know, they come with inherent challenges. They're complex to deploy, and projects can take years and cost millions. Uh, sometimes the operators don't really like the interface and, and think they're hard to use. Um, and using a monolithic system, it's typically an all or nothing approach. So, so it's very high risk to, to go in that direction. You're also typically locked in to using the organization for future support, enhancement, modifications. And uh, you know the big one, there's a heavy IT lift to these systems. And if you have an IT organization that doesn't really understand what's happening at the shop floor, it's a huge challenge. 
challenge uh, to implement this. Um, and this last point sort of speaks to the point above about being locked in. Unless you onboard a team for MBR development and maintenance, uh, you really need to rely on the vendor or uh, or a team of third party integrators. Um, you know, it's difficult to maintain on your own. So as, as Bill and Florian will detail out later, the way to an EBR is through the inputs. And uh, the image below, you know, is kind of interesting. It has a, you see the physical plant there with the, the inputs, the raw materials coming in and, uh, and being converted into finished product. You know, but the product itself isn't sellable without the associated uh, batch record behind it. So as you can see below, you have the hidden plant and all the inputs that go into the batch record, you know, the materials information and log books, uh, QC results, standard operating procedures and work instructions, and so on. So there's, there's opportunity to, uh, to start at this, the input side, you know, to start small and then, and then scale up and grow. Okay, so now Bill's going to give his perspective, backed up by decades of industry experience implementing MES and EBR, and he's going to walk through some of the barriers and opportunities. Yep, thank you, thank you, Brian. So when we talk about the digital batch record, the digital batch record is one part of a larger electronic execution or electronic workflow, and it's hard to separate the two. So as I talk about these benefits, the benefits are realized with the combined electronic workflow or application and the digital batch record that is created by these workflows. So the first benefit I list is process improvements that can be identified with the digital solution. By having a digital solution and digital data, data mining and analysis can go much quicker and much easier. And I wanna take a, a minute here to explain what I mean by digital. Just because data is electronic doesn't necessarily mean it's digital. If the data is only available in a PDF report, or if I have to go ask my IT department to write a custom query, then in my mind, the data is not digital. Digital data needs to be readily available to the user with the appropriate context. I like to think that getting the data from the batch record should be as easy as what I could do today by going out to the internet and doing a search on my favorite sports team and finding all their stats. Getting data like that, the batch record, getting data for the batch record should be as easy as doing that. The second bullet point is efficiencies that are gained with review by exception. The application that generates the data or an application that reviews the data in a batch record should be able to verify that all the data is within a specified range. And if all the values are correct, you should be able to eliminate the need for a quality review. So this saves times and resources and eliminates whatever time it takes to do that review. It may be days, it may be weeks, but it reviews the need, it eliminates the need for a quality review. And then my last bullet point is around data integrity. The goal of any digital solution should be to eliminate any and all manual transcription of data. So to get this benefit, you need a solution that integrates the batch record or the application that produces the batch record with plant floor devices and other systems. So implementing digital solutions in a digital batch record will lead you towards a, a data-driven culture. And with opportunities, there also comes barriers. So this slide here addresses the barriers. And I titled it Barriers, but after thinking about it, I think I should rename it Barrier Singular. In all my years working in the manufacturing execution space, the problem has always been the same. It takes a lot of time. I don't know how many times I've been asked, why is this taking so long, or can you go quicker? And it's the same problem across the entire industry. Uh, several years ago, I attended an MES conference and talked to someone from another pharmaceutical company. They said that implementing the execution workflows and the associated batch records for their entire facility took them six years. And this length of time is not uncommon. And so what I have on the slide here, there are three bullet points from Biofarm's MES of the Future Manifesto. 
and they identify the same problem. That is one, deployment is slow and expensive. Two, the solutions are slow to implement. And three, they require highly technical resources for implementation support. So across the industry, there seems to be one primary barrier and that is time to implement or better said, time to value. So how do we improve on that? Next slide addresses some ways to improving time to value. So the first approach I have here is to think about modularity and reuse. It starts with working across functions in your organization to develop common business practices and common process models. These models can include things like material adjustment or material addition, pH adjustment, sampling, blending, drying, dispensing, etc. So the standardizing the processes may take a long time and you may also see that it creates some organizational tension, but in the long run, it provides bigger benefits. A second approach I list here is to consider digitizing your batch production record one page at a time. So when you have production records on the order of 100 or maybe 200 pages, it could take a year or more to realize the value. By taking the approach of doing one page at a time, you can focus on the highest value and realize the benefits more quickly. And then the final bullet point is around what I consider as a definition of MES. A lot of people think of MES as manufacturing execution systems. I think it should be manufacturing execution solutions. And so what we're seeing is with industry 4.0, there are more and more smart IoT devices and we're going to see more and more distributed applications. So the point here is that manufacturing execution, the digital batch record doesn't need necessarily need to be done in one big MES system. So pick whatever combination of systems or pick whatever combination of applications are right for you. So hopefully with these three approaches, you should be able to improve your time to value. And at this point, I'm gonna turn the webinar over to Florian. So, thanks a lot. And um, let's talk about, um, before we actually talk about time to value, let's talk about how value is generated. And first ha let's have a deeper look into like a classic MES EBR system. So um, on, on this slide, you see a very, I would say almost optimistic view on uh, value generation of an MES system because it already starts after 12 months. In my experience, it usually takes at least 16 or 18 months before you can go live with a classic monolithic system. Um, however, one point is clear. So the value of a classic um, EBR solution only starts with go live. And before that, you will invest a lot of time, effort, and maybe even sweat and pain uh, into that solution to get it to the point that you actually can go live. And while you're doing that, there will be absolutely no payment into your business case. So you will only be investing in, in that time. And the bad news is when you finally went live, the payback you get is most likely even lower than what you expected because um, you may have missed some requirements as a specification phase. Maybe some requirements got implemented wrong. Maybe some operators do not use the system as they should do. And there can be many reasons why you do not get the exact same payback you were expecting from the system. And um, so the value which is coming out of the system actually goes, goes down over time. And um, now you're facing the problem that you have like requirements you need to meet which are not in the current system. So you may want to do another customization to the system to get those covered or even implementing a workaround or um, even having another point solution addressing those requirements. And uh, all that doesn't help with value generation. Next slide, please. So um, I think all that makes it quite clear that there needs to be a better way of doing that. And um, having value after 12 to 16 months and before that time, nothing is not the ideal way. Um, there's 
a method which is called Agile. And to be honest, Agile is not, not new. It's around since many years. I would not say forever. It still feels new, but it's definitely not new anymore. And uh, one question is, why do classic EBR deployments do not use more agile approaches to, to deploy the system? And the answer is simple, they can't. And reason for that is that those systems are not built for being deployed incrementally or agile in small portions. If you deploy a big monolithic system incrementally to the production areas, this is definitely not agile. This is just risk mitigation. So what you need really to follow a more agile methodology is a flexible system, which can basically follow those small work packages you create. I will not go into the details of how, a, how agile actually works. I think you all have better sources on get educated on agile approaches. However, um, if you link Agile to an EBR project, at the end of the day, it means you need to break down everything into small working packages, which you execute one by one. Some of them may be in parallel, and you need the ability to adjust those packages while you're going, because there might be things you have missed at the beginning or which you need to follow up later on. Next slide, please. So if we look now into the first step of um, what would need to happen in order to start a more agile oriented EBR project, um, one thing is, is really clear. Um, you need to understand what your business objectives are. Uh, a customer of mine once said a very interesting sentence. He said, making a business case for MES or EBR is like making a business case for indoor plumbing. And back at the time, I thought, okay, easy, perfect, so I don't need to do a business case. We can just go and do the MES project. But boy, how was I wrong? So this the sentence basically says that the features and the functions and the offerings an EBR system provides to the operator and to the organization will clearly provide benefits. So doing things like review by exception, guiding operators through the workflow, all that, you don't need to prove that this is creating value, everybody knows that. However, if you look on the cost side of getting to that state, so to actually get to review by exception, what a tremendous investment is needed in terms of time, money, and resources is not really considered here. And I, I, I received recently an, an RFP for an EBR system. And one of the business objectives listed in there was to remove paper from the shop floor. And I was thinking, OK, that's great. Consider the environment, saving some trees, less paper is better. But to be perfectly honest, I don't think removing paper is a business objective, which is uh, actually there. What very often happens based on the fact that the solutions like EBR systems offer are proven is that companies stop thinking about actual mapping what they're asking for to the actual objectives. So by telling vendors, I want to have an EBR solution, which is doing this, and here is my user requirement specification, you're actually dictating already the solution you think for yourself is solving your problems. But the link to the actual objectives is missing. And that's, I think, a common problem in, in these days that often companies do believe they already know what they need and do no longer think openly around possible solutions to, this, to the problem. There might be other ways to how to achieve the same or better results. So long story short, you need clear business objectives. And with those, we go to the next slide. When you have clear business objectives, you need to understand what does actually help with those objectives. So how do I measure how what I'm currently doing is actually helping me towards those objectives? 
And if you do a project with, with Tulip, this is basically built into the project DNA. So in everything we do, we will map um, the income or the benefits which the current activity generates towards the business case. In some cases, we even build that into the applications we create to solve a certain business challenge. So if you have an app application which gets executed multiple times, every time you execute that application, some data will be collected around how much time you have saved or how much money you have saved or whatever the target was. And this data can be later on visualized towards management to make it clear how much value this one app have created towards the objectives of the company. And um, this also leads to the fact that you can actually prioritize where you start. So you, of course, start there where you can generate the most value. Nobody says you need to start where the process starts or where the process ends or on page one of the batch record. Nobody is dictating this. So what you really want to do is you want to work towards the objectives of the organization to create the most value out of what you're doing. And this can be different than like classical approaches where you start at the beginning and finish at the beginning. Um, one thing is very, very important, and that is failing. That sounds weird, but um, at the end of the day, if you run an agile project and you realize while you do a certain activity or implement a certain app or digitizing something else, that this is actually not really helping with the overall situation. It doesn't pay into the business case, doesn't create value. So it needs to be easy to stop that activity and just do something else. So at the end of the day, you need to make sure that the outcome of what you do is really quantifiable. That's it's pretty simple, straightforward. That needs to be ensured. Um, next slide, please. So what you do is you, at the beginning of the project, you should target the low hanging fruits, which if the company said, I want to do an EBR project, is most likely not doing an EBR project. It is looking into the production, understanding where can I generate the most value and start there with the first applications. This can be, even if you want to do an EBR project, this can be, for example, some logbook applications. Logbooks are paper. Paper is painful because you want to remove it from the paper because some say it's an objective. But you also have the cost of handling paper. You have the cost of archiving paper and saving costs and being more efficient. That could be actually an objective. So as a first small step, you could say, OK, I'm digitizing the logbooks in a certain area. With that, you can already educate people on the new way of executing projects, because with an agile deployment methodology, you can work together with the subject matter experts from the areas, and they can actually contribute in the creation of the application. They can provide input on what is their daily problem, where do things usually go wrong. So you basically have all the experts already inside of your company, which can help with to build or in, contribute to the ideal digitalization application, ideal support application for whatever use case you currently have on hand. And from there, you can start to dig digitize um, a certain area. And you can start like classical EBR deployments in Wayne Dispense, but you can also just start with managing the equipment in the Wayne Dispense area or managing just one room or managing one material um, staging process. So all that is possible uh, with an agile system where you can basically pick and choose the areas where you want to work in. And so you basically start small and grow from there. And one thing is fundamental if you do an agile project, you really need to build a framework for continuous improvement. So if you have created the first iteration of your work package, make sure that you do a second, third, and fourth one, um, because you can always improve. It can always create more value, less effort. And you have all the data you need inside of your company, because those apps you have created, which are already running, are actually helping you to um, 
get data from the operators or from the operations to optimize the process. And with this approach, you create applications which are covering in, in small work packages. And when you finish the first work packages, you're actually already getting value from those first work packages. And we're talking weeks here. So after six weeks, most likely the first applications are up and running and already providing value back to you, paying into your business case while you do the rest of the project. And one important statement here, and this is, might be hard to understand, but finishing a project fast does not mean fast time to value. So it just means that you have maybe done something quick and dirty, but an agile project can take longer, especially if you factor in the continuous improvement part of it. It can run for quite some time, but the big advantage is it doesn't cost more because you get all the payback already from those applications. Next slide, please. So let's talk about, um, let's, let's say, let's decrease the flight level a little bit. So, so far we had a fairly theoretical exercise on how you should start with your EBR project. And if we go to the next slide, let's talk a little bit about what can be done and how can you actually start with Tulip. So, like I mentioned earlier with the statement of my customer, you don't need to prove that certain activities, certain functions of an electronic batch recording system do provide value. And um, with that in mind, we have created the Tulip library. Uh, the Tulip library is a collection of applications which are focusing on the typical, let's call them low hanging fruit use cases. Um, which you can use as a starting point for your digitalization journey. So you, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You can basically take those applications as a starting point, adjust them to your needs, work with your operators together to understand how those templates or applications work in the area, and then you can start to digitize your production with those low hanging fruit areas to start with. The big advantage here is um, like my example before with the logbooks, you expose already a lot of operators in your areas to the new way of, of Tulip, which means they are not getting a system just presented, which they need to use, where you need to train them. They are, will be part of the change and Change management is one of the areas where I would say classical EBR projects very often fail. So it's hard to train the operators. It's hard to convince them to do a different way of working. But if you make them part of that activity that they can actually participate in the creation of the applications, have influence on what data they get presented when and, and what, why and where, this will really help with the adoption on the shop floor. And this also paves the road towards continuous improvement because only then, if they have been part of that, they will also provide feedback to the continuous improvement. So you will get all the information you need from your people because it's all in your factory, it's all there, all the data is in the system, and you can use that to optimize your, your processes. If you have done all that, let's go to the next slide. You have created, I would call it an ecosystem of applications, which does digitize every corner of your production. So now you may be asking, okay, that's all fine. I have apps, but where's my batch record? And um, the truth is your batch record is no longer a paper, which is hiding information or no longer a PDF document, which is may be considered digital, but it's still really not because like, like Bill said earlier, it's in there, but I cannot find it. I cannot search it. I cannot contextualize it. So what really happens here with this ecosystem of application is that you digitize your workplaces through the eyes of an operator. And those operators do their daily work. And while doing that, 
um, they're basically collecting the data which is later on needed to be contextualized in the context of a batch. Sounds very theoretical. Uh, in a real world example, this would be like, for example, let's take an easy example to start with, uh, a weighing dispensing application. So the things you can do in a weighing booth is quite limited. So you can go in there, you can check your equipment, you may need a container, you may need raw materials. You, you probably know that better than I do. So the different workflows variations inside of the weighing booth are limited. Um, however, there's a certain sequence to be followed in order to produce a certain product. So what you do is you basically configure the app that if product A comes, the operator needs this button, this information, this raw material, and you also let the application talk to the IP system to book the material consumption and things like that. So you basically digitizing the workflow, you're digitizing your batch record based on the steps which needs to be taken. And with that, you can hit with one application, 50, 100, 200 batch records by just entering the data points which are needed, which to be honest for weighing dispensing most of the times is just quantities which are coming from the ERP system anyhow. So if we now move on into the production, let's stay at the example of a solid production where we just produce a simple a tablet and, and go into the formulation here. Um, if you look now there, there could be potentially some more variations between the products. Here again, um, you don't need to do one application for um, many products. You can also say, okay, if it's too complicated to cover all that in one application, you just do 50. And you can do that very easily because you will just create a template for that work area, which you then duplicate according to whatever you need. And once you have your ecosystem of applications for each batch, you can um, use grouping functionality to group those applications together, together so that the system will know what kind of data belongs to what batch. And at the end of the production, you have a truly electronic record of your production. And Tulip is a platform which is built for those kind of activities. So you get all the tools you need together with that platform to govern this maybe large scale of amount of applications uh, in an enterprise environment. So you have version control, you have rights management. So all the things you would expect from a system are part of this activity. And on top of that, by you can not only do the simple things like letting the operator type in data or scan a barcode, um, you can also use modern technology like vision. So Tulip Vision is a nice feature which we just implemented in a batch record of another customer. They had, um, we just talked about data silos. So you often have systems which doing their stuff, collecting data electronically, and but you don't get to that data because it was, when it was implemented, not needed to get to the data. So this customer had a similar system and the data was displayed on an HMI. So what we did, we just put a camera in front of the HMI to read the values and transcribe them automatically into the batch record so that this system was integrated without integrating it. So that was pretty straightforward. So long story short, you group all those applications together um, into an ecosystem that share a common data model all the data from all apps is available to everyone. You can create all the reporting which is needed. And with that, you truly digitize your production and you did not follow your batch record step by step. You did not start at the beginning of the process. You actually started there where the most value is generated. So you get basically value after week four to six from the project towards the entire project. And this is how you improve time to value. One thing I have not, a word I have not used throughout the entire presentation, which most likely the majority of you is now wondering how we do that. And this word was validation. So validation is of course very important. I also didn't use the words like industry requirements. You need to have um, clear data. The data needs to be um, consistent. All, all that to be honest, for, to me, is commodity. Every system who is, or every vendor, every system who is playing in the life science industry 
needs to fulfill those requirements. That's why I didn't even talk about it. It's of course built into the system, electronic records, electronic signatures, 21 part 11 compliance, all part of the platform. So I will not go into detail here. Um, just believe me, many customers using it already. So that works. So coming back to the validation, um, validation is very important. And Tulip has a pretty good trick to even enable continuous improvement in a validated environment, which in my understanding of the industry is unique. So first of all, what we do is Tulip develops this platform, the Tulip platform. Um, the development of that is governed by our quality management system, which governs the entire software development lifecycle. So we're delivering a qualified version to our customers. And when I say delivering, it's basically software as a service. So we activate it for them. And then the customer can take that delivery and together with our documentation and take a risk-based approach and then consider the platform validated after maybe some additional testing, depending what the risk assessment said. This leads to a validated platform in their environment, so they have access to that platform. So far, it's pretty much the same like all the other vendors who deliver in qualified software. The trick starts now with the applications, when you create application. And I on purpose use the word create because you don't program those applications because those applications are not software. Those applications are content of a validated platform. And this content you can basically validate by with a simple, in quotation marks, end-to-end -end test with some risk-based challenges. So basically it's the same workflow you would follow for a paper document. And the beauty here is that based on all the agile talk I had before, you have been smart about your project and built small apps, which are, you can incrementally improve, which means each app you can validate individually, I cannot say the word, you know what I mean? And, and you can, each app has its own life cycle, which means you can update one app while all the other apps still running without taking the system down. And this, truly opens the door for continuous improvement because you can just do it and it will not have an impact to the rest of the site. And I think that's a true game changer and this is a true enabler for agile EBR projects with Tulip. That next slide. And back to you. All right, gentlemen. Uh, so let's recap. So we've pulled out three simple takeaways for you to keep with you as you either begin or continue your EBR journey. So first, to put it in simple terms, you need your EBR system to prove its value. You do this by going back to your business objectives and making sure that your system's functionality is based on those objectives. Second, consider choosing a platform over a monolith. A platform is modular and you can select the apps that you need when you need them. And third, aim for speed and continuous improvement. As you've seen, an app suite enhances time to value through flexibility, an ability to grow and add new functionality as that functionality is needed. And finally, a call to action. The combination of Tulip, the app suite and the platform and Grant Tech with its implementation services will enable your organization to achieve a successful transition away from paper records and toward digital data while maintaining traceability. And now we'll open up the uh, presentation, sorry, we'll conclude the presentation and open it up to questions. Uh, so we have a question coming in here. Um, it has been tough with the knowledge transfer when working with EBR and getting the right people to build this out. Uh, what is the skill set of the people needed to use Tulip since it is no code? Uh, maybe, maybe I can start on that and Florian, if you want to elaborate. Um, I mean, 
the the no code platform makes tulip uh you know pretty advantageous to use for people in the you know for example a process engineer a uh, manufacturing engineer manufacturing science and technology folks those who really understand the underlying processes of the manufacturing organization um, and so uh, you don't really need a specialized uh, you know knowledge of uh, software development you just need you, you know maybe some uh, you know UI UX type skills to to be able to um, you know design a template uh, for your application to, to sit on but uh, but really yeah I think um, you know it's it's almost uh, democratizing the the development process in that in that you don't need to be a software engineer have a software engineering background to uh, to use it yeah I think I, I, I fully in line with you and so here um, one thing which is um, especially when it comes to EBR project, um, important is so EBR project is of course a more complex activity because it goes from through the entire production process so which means um, when we start those projects we always recommend our customers to work with a partner to get the basics in the wireframes of the applications and then when it actually comes to the actual process requirements then the, the nice thing is that really people from the area subject matter experts are able to contribute to the development process and those people do not need any special skills so i always say like with a skill set of powerpoint and excel you get very far into it uh, okay we have another question i think this question was asked uh by somebody at the point of registration um can tulip be adapted to electronic sops yeah, that, that's an um, interesting question. Um, to be honest, I think that's kind of what we're doing anyhow when we do EBR. Um, and along the way, we digitizing workflows. So, and workflows are hidden in a tremendous amount of SOPs, which are flying around in every organization and can be governed like, for example, a line clearance process. It's super efficient and uh, clear value to create a line clearance application with Tulip, walking the operators through the process, helping them along the way. So you basically combine electronic work instructions with the quality requirements of an SOP, which to even could make the, the classical SOP, SOP obsolete because you can cover that with a Tulip application. So yes, eSOPs is definitely one of the big areas we're doing with Tulip quite frequently. Okay. Uh, the next question came in here. Uh, you know, this this all sounds interesting, but but where is the best place to start with this? And, and I think I think I can I, again. I'll kick this off, and then uh, let the uh, the my other two uh, colleagues here uh, elaborate. Um, you know, I think uh, Florian established it. Uh, you know near the beginning of, of his portion of the presentation, a really good uh, way to, to get started is to figure out what business problem that you're, you're looking to solve with uh, a solution like this. Um, so which area you feel will provide the most value, uh, you know, those low hanging fruit. Um, and then I think in the question, in the answer to your first, to, to the first question, uh, Florian also elaborated, you know, Tulip uh, encourage their customers to to start working with a partner to build out, you know, the framework for for that first application, um, which then you know can be leveraged to expand and grow to new applications or to new uh, areas of the the business or the batch record. So, um, I think yeah, I guess to summarize, start with the batch record or sorry, start with uh, where you feel that you'll derive the most value. Yeah. Another one, I, I've seen two, two approaches, one where you get the most value. And then the second piece is maybe start on something small to get experience. And mm -hmm. that, that leads back to the agile, you know, some maybe integration with the scale, integration with the pH meter, but any experience will help you uh, more quickly implement over time.
Okay, uh, we've got another question coming in from the audience. Um, is there a particular niche or, or customer segment within the life sciences space that, that Tulip has seen the most success deploying EBR in? Um, and what are some indicators that confirm a company is a good fit uh, for Tulip EBR and, and vice versa? So um, maybe that question is directed to me. Um, mm -hmm. So it, one thing which is truly unique unique about Tulip is that we can actually serve um, batch and continuous and discrete. So we can do met device and batch and pharma production. Um, the areas where Tulip fits the best is all the classical production where you have manual operator activities. Where I would check twice if Tulip is a good fit is in highly automated process productions where you almost have lights off production. This is not what Tulip is built for. Tulip is to build to argument the operator, and this is where, where it works best. And in my experience, that's almost all of the pharma and life science production because there's rarely any lights out productions in, in life sciences. Okay, uh, let me have a, a question. Uh, I think a question for Bill actually. Uh, Bill, you mentioned a you know multiple years to to stand up a a recipe uh in a in a monolithic ebr i believe is when you were you were chatting about that um i mean how is that realistic or what is realistic with that type of with that type of an approach yeah so what, what i'm the way i'm seeing this question is okay so i'm my experience is with the with the traditional mes system and the time to do that i think the question is hitting on if we use a different solution like Tulip, how much time can we save? So I'm going to throw that one back to Florian or you, Brian. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, uh, I mean, in, in my experience from from implementing Tulip, it's it's really easy to get a working solution to a problem fairly quickly. Like you're talking. Um, you know, and for me, who a former automation professional who, um, you know, is uh, is now, uh, you know, showcased on a webinar here. <laughs> um, I mean, it was it's fairly I mean, I'm used to, you know, pretty in-depth programming activities. Um, so, I mean, you're talking like maybe like a, a couple of weeks to get something up and running fairly quick. Um, so. Uh, so, I mean, for somebody who has maybe less experience in the in the automation space or in the programming space it might take take a little bit a little bit longer than that um i don't know florian if you if you had uh, some thoughts on that as well at the end of the day it's again a question of what uh, kind of application you want to build so a simple checklist application you can learn to build within a day literally it's like powerpoint pretty straightforward if you want to do more complex applications where you need to talk to other systems, maybe, uh, or doing an EBR um, system, uh, you need to understand a little bit more and understand the capabilities, which is definitely in the in the time frame of weeks to understand how it works. Um, when we do pilots with our customers, we always say, OK, we do a pilot and the pilot will be eight weeks. In life sciences, we sometimes say eight to 10 because there will be additionally the validation discussions. But um, after eight weeks, there is a ready to go app you can put into production to digitize the use case. And I don't think there's any other solution which can deliver something in eight weeks, which is already usable. Great. Uh, so we have one more question. Uh, I think this one's for you, Florian. So, how how um, does continuous improvement work with respect to validation? Yeah, that that's a good one. Um, uh, I, I try to fo focus in the presentation on on the validation piece a little bit, and uh, the reason for that question is is cl quite clear. So, if you put in an EBR system and validate it, if you wanted to change one thing inside of that system. You need to install the next version, go through an entire validation life cycle, and um, you are in buried deep in the V model. Um, with Tulip, you have a validated platform, which you don't touch. This platform is actually the same for all our customers. 
So there is no software change you can have individually for you. It's one system. And all you change is the content, which is the applications. And those have an individual life cycle, which follows like a normal, like a paper sheet validation. And this basically enables continuous improvement because you really can change that one app with a small change you do, run your validation piece of it again, and then this app remains validated in the next version. That's why continuous improvement is possible also in a validated environment. Okay, great. Um, I think we're coming uh, close to time. So uh, just wanted to thank everybody for, uh, for attending. Thanks to uh, Bill and Florian as well uh, for joining me in, the, in this uh, webinar. And uh, so just uh, a note to all the registered attendees, you will be sent a recording of the session. Um, and if you have any other, any further questions uh, that uh, you didn't get answered today, um, you know, please email those to info at grantech.com. Uh, you see that on the screen. Uh, so yeah, thanks again. And everybody have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.